Hello, everyone. A very good evening, good morning, good afternoon to you wherever you are. We are glad that you could join us today. My name is Tojo Ethan. I will be your moderator today. Warm welcome to today's LOBA career guidance session on core engineering and technology streams. It is with great pleasure I welcome you all to this session. We have a really interesting, highly accomplished, and diverse engineering panel today. Special thank you to panel members who are joining us from the US quite early, your morning time. We sincerely hope that everyone participating will find something valuable from today's session. I would also like to remind everyone that our next panel discussion and last in the series, focusing on IT, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence will happen next Sunday. Please be on the lookout for more information there. So to start with, we would like to quickly share some housekeeping guidelines for our attendees. So please send us questions for panel members via the Q&A box in Zoom. Um, to help us navigate smoothly, questions must be short and to the point. And due to time limitation, only questions related to career guidance can be discussed or responded to today. Relevant and unanswered questions will be replied to, uh, due to if it is due to time shortage uh, via email after the session. Please note that we won't be able to respond to any anonymous questions later. So do leave your email ID wherever possible and comfortable. And we thank you for your understanding. So quick introduction about myself. So I'm from the 92 batch and currently work as a partner with Standard Chase International. Uh, we are a global leadership search and consulting firm. My key areas of interest are leadership and human resource management. I've also previously worked in the US and Europe and I'm currently based in Hyderabad. Personally, I'm excited to be here. Grateful for this opportunity to moderate a brilliant panel and really looking forward to a very interesting discussion today. So without any further delay, let's go to our brilliant and highly accomplished panel members who hold Guinness Book Records, patents, distinguished awards, achievements for their quick introductions. So we will proceed in an alphabetical manner or an order and start with Professor or Dr. Ajayan. Uh, Ajayan, a very warm welcome to you and over to you for your introduction, please. Thank you, Tojo. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I'm from Houston. Uh, as you can see, I am from the 77 batch, probably the oldest on the panel. Um, I've been an academic uh, ever since I can remember. I've uh, been a professor for very many years now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really nice to be here. I, I distinctly remember a lot of things that happened at Biola School when I was there. Originally, I'm from Kudungallur in uh, close to Trichur. Uh, I actually work on this area of nanomaterials, nanotechnology. Uh, that's my research area. And uh, the broad area of uh, my academic career has been in the materials, science, and engineering. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we will have a great panel today, and uh, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajay, and uh, 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 one of our star members in the panel, and we are happy to have you here. Uh, Deepu, over to you, please, for your introduction. Thank you, Tojo. Um, I'm excited to be on this uh, panel today. I'm uh, Deepu John. I'm based in uh, San Diego, California. You can think of this city, the city that I live in, as the Trivandrum of the U.S. It's the southwestmost city uh, of the United States. Uh, 30 minutes drive down from here is uh, Mexico. I work for a company named Qualcomm. I'm in uh, product management. Qualcomm has been the driving force behind cellular wireless communication going all the way from 2.5G. You probably have heard about 3G and then 4G, which is broadly deployed in India right now. And currently, we are in the midst of deploying 5G worldwide. I used to be in engineering, but now I'm in product management, which we will cover in further detail 
later. Again, excited to be on this panel. I was from the 1986 batch at Loyola School in Trivandrum. Thank you very much, Debu. Wonderful to have you on our panel. And uh, the company you mentioned, we see it almost everywhere nowadays on all our mobile phones. So great to have you. Thank you. Over to you, Krishna Chandran, for your introduction. Hi, um, my name is Krishna and I'm from the 1996 batch. I'm based in Bangalore. My background is uh, originally in architecture, then I studied landscape architecture and eventually uh, did a PhD in what is called environmental planning, which is sort of between environmental sciences and city planning. Uh, I have an architecture practice, which is largely based out of uh, New Delhi. It's called SPA Design. And I'm in the process of also working in Trivandrum now, especially with a focus on energy and resource efficiency in, in the context of buildings. I also happen to have a sort of parallel career in what can be described as spatial data science. Uh, that is sort of like a subset of data science where you're using uh, methods from computer science statistics and so on to answer questions which typically involve large data sets. In this case, the, the spatial piece sort of comes from the focus on map-based data sets and satellite imagery and things like that. But I'm not a computer scientist or a statistician, obviously, but I work with a team of people uh, from many of these disciplines. And uh, the, this research work largely happens out of uh, the Indian Institute for Human Settlements here in Bangalore. I work with a geospatial lab there. Um, and I think um, in general, across both of these sort of parallel tracks, there is a kind of common theme around, I think, sustainability and understanding cities and uh, at multiple scales. Uh, thank you, over to Tobi. Thank you very much, Krishna, for your introduction. Really interesting mix of things that, that we, we should explore further as we discuss. Um, and to another senior member uh, in this panel, uh, over to you, Ranji, please, for your introduction. Hey, Tojo, thank you. Um, again, my name is Renji Kumar. Um, I'm the same batch as Professor Rajan, so 77. Um, and, you know, since uh, finishing school at Loyola, uh, you know, as the slide says, I had an opportunity to do engineering in Trivandrum. Uh, my home is in Trivandrum. And then we um, moved from mechanical engineering, which is a very foundational engineering uh, line to aerospace engineering, a little bit more specific. Uh, I presently work in a small company when AMA stands for Analytical Mechanics Associates. Uh, we are a consulting company, uh, mostly doing aerospace work. We work with NASA um, predominantly, but we also work with Department of Defense. And we also have other than aerospace engineering, we have applied some of the skills learned from aerospace engineering based on mathematics um, to things like analytic, analytics, like data analytics. Uh, we have customers like Capital One, uh, which is a big credit card company. We have also other customers like Humana, health insurance company. Uh, but so, you know, you can go from aerospace to many other areas based on the basic foundation of mathematics. So that's uh, uh, our company. We are about 450 people. And uh, I think, um, you know, I'm so happy to join and uh, talk to some of our, our loyalites and uh, looking forward to um, a interactive session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranji. And, and if, I, if I may add, uh, uh, probably the only Keralite and, and the second Indian to win a NASA's uh, public, Distinguished Public Service Medal, is that, is that correct? That is true. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Great to have you on our panel. Thank you for finding time as well. And last but not least, we have Vipin. Uh, Vipin, over to you for your introduction, please. Thank you, Dojo. Um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody on the call. Um, I am so happy to be here uh, just talking to this up and coming young generation of Loyalites. Um, I, I, I do want to tell you that an inflection point in my life was when an ex like came over to Loyola and, and talked to um, my class when I was in the 11th. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, I can help open your eyes up to the world of supply chain, which, which I am in right now. Um, 
listen, the way, the way that I would think about supply chains is um, if you buy anything from anywhere, there's a supply chain involved in getting that product over to you, right? Whether it's in high tech, whether it's in retail. And, and the best example that I can, I can tell you is the world is facing its biggest, arguably its biggest logistics challenge ever right now. How do you inoculate uh, or um, vaccinate billions of people in such a short span of time? And there's a supply chain involved in that. From a career standpoint, I, I work at Walmart. Walmart's the largest retailer um, on earth, uh, employing about two and a half million people, biggest in terms of revenue. Uh, and I manage e-commerce transportation for Walmart. Uh, and my hope is that, um, you know, coming out of this, um, all of you, sort of have a wide view into engineering and how engineering can help build, manage uh, supply chain. So back to you, Tojo. Thank you, Vipin. Uh, great to have you on our panel. And, and uh, we were discussing at some point. So Vipin has one of the top jobs in e-commerce transportation or supply chain uh, in the US, which is also, you know, for someone wanting to explore supply chain, he's probably one of the best people to, to throw some questions to on the topic. Uh, so now that we've met our panelists, thank you all for your introduction. Uh, very, very distinguished. Uh, I would say a star-studded panel in terms of uh, experiences and diversity in experiences. We have multiple areas uh, in engineering. Now that we have met our panelists, could we see the composition of our audience today? Can I have the first poll question, please? So for, for attendees, if you could please click, select your answer and click Summit. So we're trying to understand the attendee profile. And probably another 10 more seconds and we can close the poll. So audience, please select your answer quickly and submit. Great. Okay, that's great to see. So, so we have more than half of our uh, participants are from school. That's wonderful. We welcome all the other participants from other Jesuit schools as well. Great to see you here. Thank you for joining. Great to see some parents, ex loyalites as well. And, and welcome to the staff who have been joining all our sessions. Uh, can we go to the second question, please? How interested are you or your child in the careers being discussed today? So this is just to gauge your interest. Again, if you could quickly click and submit. Another 10 more seconds. We can close. Okay, we see a, a broad profile. So 60% very interested, 33 interested. And that, that adds up to 93. And uh, we hope the others will also get something interesting out of today's discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. So uh, thank you all for your participation. We are looking forward to a very interesting discussion with our panelists. Uh, let's jump into our questions. Uh, so uh, for the panelists, let's start with your career journey. You know, how did you choose your career and how did you reach your current area of work? Uh, and uh, we'll start with Professor Ajayan again. And Ajayan, I'm curious because you know, nanotechnology, nanomaterials, how, 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 how do you get there? So it will be very interesting to hear your story. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes sometimes uh, things happen in life, right? Uh, you know, if I look back uh, when I was a student in high school and even further, uh, STEM or science was really not my favorite subject. I mean, I, I never thought that I would become a scientist. Uh, in fact, I was fascinated by history and things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, those days, and this was a long time ago, uh, when we were choosing careers, uh, especially if you wanted to do well, if you were good in uh, what you did, uh, academics, uh, there was not too many options. You know, you either became an engineer or uh, a doctor, and certainly medicine was not my cup of tea. So I went to do engineering. Um, I mean, I, I wrote the IIT JEE exam and got in and went to IIT Banaras. <laughs> and uh, again, you know, th those days. Um, Everybody was, and especially if you are in an IIT, everyone was writing GRE and trying to go to the United States. And uh, I did the same thing. So you can see that in my career, it was pretty much linear. 
uh, throughout. Uh, and, and research is in some sense, uh, you know, a linear progression of things. Uh, and uh, again, there are circumstances and coincidences that happen in your life uh, that uh, uh, ultimately decides wh what your career is going to be. So when I was at uh, Northwestern doing my PhD, towards the end of my PhD, uh, I met uh, a gentleman from Japan uh, whose name was Sumio Ijima. And uh, uh, you know, again, uh, fascinated by what he did. Uh, and decided to go to Japan for uh, take a break from the U.S. and go to Japan uh, to do some research, and uh, you know that, that was kind of the beginning of my uh, real career because uh, you know again I wanted to say that timing is sometimes very important. I went to Japan in the early '90s, and that's where uh, this whole nano tubes and nanotechnology was invented. Uh, so I, I was fortunate to be at that place at the right time. Uh, and then it was kind of, um, you know, a great journey, uh, looking at uh, this fascinating area of nanomaterials and nanotechnology, which uh, will have a huge impact in, in all our future lives. Uh, so, and again, you know, to some extent, you know, whether it was history or science, I was always interested in teaching and, uh, and imparting knowledge to other people. Uh, so, you know, the, the good choice to, to me was to be in academics. Of course, you can do research in other places as well. Uh, so, I mean, since that time, I've been a teacher and a researcher. Uh, so that, that kind of sums up my career. And uh, uh, again, you know, there are, there are always subtle things uh, that you can point out, but um, I always wanted to be a teacher. So that, that, that's where I am. Great. Thank you very much. And, and it, it goes without saying, I think I noticed somewhere a thousand papers to your credit and I don't know how many distinguished medals and achievements have come your way. So, so really uh, still very humble, uh, but thank you for sharing Ajay and, and thanks for the response. Uh, Deepu, over to you. Thank you, Jojo. Uh, my uh, career journey started probably somewhere around the age of five. Uh, my uh, grandfather got me interested in engineering. I don't think that was his intent. He was a mechanical engineer, so I think he just enjoyed it. And he just wanted to transmit his joy on. So I was getting familiar with the names of tools and fixing things. And I found myself tinkering a lot. So at a young age, uh, my desire was to be an engineer. And then things actually worked out where I, 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 went, I studied at College of Engineering in Trivandrum. Uh, doing electronics. Uh, having done that, I wanted broader exposure. And at that time, I felt I should go to the US. I did a master's in electrical engineering. What we call electronics engineering in India is called electrical engineering in the US. And my specialization was uh, chip design. Um, VLSI engineering was what it's called. So chip design, the way I look at it, what you're really doing is taming the chaos of electrons. You are literally channeling electrons through silicon. So if you take a, a very small space silicon dye, you're purifying silicon sand, literally from the seashore, purifying into 99.99999, how many other nines you want to add, uh, percentage purity. And then you are channeling electrons within it over billions of little switches so that Let's say you pick up your phone or you turn on your laptop, you expect it predictably to do work almost 100% of the time. And people's lives depend on it. Uh, uh, high, we need to build highly reliable systems. Anyway, so uh, I found that exciting, did that, and uh, joined a company that was fairly small at that time. Company's name was Qualcomm. When somebody told me about it first, I said, Qual what? Because I, didn't even, I hadn't even heard the name of the company. Um, now, in hindsight, I realized it was a $200, $250 million revenue company. And anyway, I joined there. It was very exciting. I did engineering for about six years, involved in designing, again, the chips that go into cell phones. Those days, phones were really phones. You only spoke into it. They were not smartphones, but it was pretty exciting. But six years into it, I was feeling restless. I had great respect for engineering, loved engineering, but I kind of felt I had figured out the system and I was getting restless. So then I moved into product management. In the beginning, I didn't know what it was. I had a fair a general understanding, but not detailed understanding. I characterized product management, just like engineering is, in this case, 
taming the chaos of electrons to make it predictable. Product management is taming the chaos of the market and what consumers want so that we know what product to build. At Qualcomm, I got an opportunity in product management. So we are basically the interface between the market, the customer, uh, consumer, and the products we built. So I moved to product management and Qualcomm. So at that point, I moved into the business side, but to do what I do, uh, you need to have a firm understanding of engineering. So product management was my second career. And then smartphones took off currently at Qualcomm. I'm involved in deploying uh, 5G worldwide. We have uh, the Snapdragon line of products. So I manage multiple lines of Snapdragon products, which if you have bought any phone, in the last, let's say, 20 years from any customer, whether it be Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, Motorola, Samsung, LG, any of these customers, it has Qualcomm's chips in it. So I find it exciting to see that in any of your phones, when people use it, it's uh, powered by the technology that we built and leverages the power of technology itself. So currently I'm focused on uh, enabling smartphones globally. And that's how I got to product management. I think I'll stop there, Tojo, and hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Deepu. And for those interested uh, uh, in, in listening to more of the 5G perspective, Deepu was on NDTV's Gadgets Now show for those tracking the Gadgets show on NDTV. I've been, I've been watching it on and off for many years now. So, so you can check out Gadgets Now there. Uh, Krishna Chandran, over to you. Thank you, Tojo. So, uh... Well, in my case, the the decision to do architecture was, I think, pretty straightforward and very clear. But uh, how I ended up with this parallel career in data science is somewhat more convoluted. So maybe I'll first talk about the architecture piece. So I, I well, all through school and so on, I was very, very interested in visual stuff, was very obsessed with photography, even though I didn't have a camera at that time, and uh, drawing, and also did quite well in math, science, and all of those kinds of things. So then uh, uh, one of the first times I got really interested in architecture was when I was, I think, in class uh, four or five and, and four, five, six and so on. I used to, every summer I used to go and spend a lot of time with an uncle of mine. He was a physicist who uh, kind of took voluntary retirement from a central government body. And then he went and pretty much designed and built his own house uh, quite far outside Trivandrum on a kind of hill, hillside. It used to be a really nice place at that time. But the interesting thing was he was very much like a do-it-yourself type of person, would do the plumbing himself, do all of that. So I used to go and spend the summer a few weeks with him. And the house, I still think it was a very, very it's nice, very, very nice house, you know. And uh, being a physicist, he had a very different approach towards architecture from, you know, what was conventionally happening at that time. And so he used to explain to me all these things, you know, hot air rising, he used to have all these ventilation systems, his house was reusing uh, wastewater, you know, from his washing machine and bath water for irrigation uh, downhill from his house and all kinds of interesting things like that. And then um, I, I happened to be at another, uh, you know, I used to do this thing of spending these breaks with different relatives and so on. Another uncle of mine was designing a house much later when I was in class nine or 10. And he was trying to build an extension to his own house. And I realized that I was far better than him at figuring out how to kind of go about doing it. Then I thought, oh, maybe this is not too bad. Maybe I kind of have some sense of this. And to some extent, I guess, uh, growing up in Trivandrum and especially school, you know, having all those Laurie Baker buildings, I think at some level, it also had an influence in the sense that uh, you, you had this general idea that there are many ways of making buildings it's not just one it's not just a very straightforward thing that there are many many different approaches to doing this so ended up studying architecture in delhi worked for three years there and uh, that kind of gave me the sense that it's uh, i don't really want to focus only on the building but it's more about designing an environment designing the built stuff as well as the outdoor spaces and so on and it's about a kind of coherence experience it's not just about what is inside the building or the object which you're designing and i also got more and more interested while working on various projects in Delhi on uh, uh, on the one hand on ecology and ecological aspects, especially related to water, and on the other hand around energy and building energy use. So eventually I had to pick one of the two. So I ended up studying landscape architecture with more of a focus on the environmental aspects. But 
given the you know the way the us university system works it was great to be able to take courses in all sorts of things including building energy and all of those things at the end of my masters i actually got a fellowship to study traditional water management systems in a few arid regions of the world including india and i ended up traveling all over india much more than i originally planned and realized that uh, water management in cities is, is a big issue and that there are many layers to this historically over time how things have evolved um and so i really felt felt that this is something i would really want to explore more and ended up after another 2 years or so applying for a phd to work on groundwater but then as i started working on groundwater i realized that we don't even really understand our cities very well and then my work kind of drifted more and more towards mapping and analysis of cities uh trying to develop new methods in fact a large part of what i worked was uh methods for mapping population in cities at a high resolution using satellite image processing and uh, other types of spatial analysis methods and uh, that's how i ended up with more the, more towards the spatial data science and now as i said i work with an organization called indian institute for human settlements which focuses on urbanization questions especially in india and other um, countries in the global south uh and i work with a kind of team of people from different disciplines on these questions right thank you krishna uh, in fact that's an area which has probably you know a lot of people interested locally as well you know there were times in trivandrum where we said this would not be a problem but now we're seeing this as a problem as well so so your work has practical relevance i think across india and and, and in trivandrum as well thank you for that and and looking forward to hearing more for those interested uh, of course uh, krishna is always humble about it he did his phd from berkeley and so probably if anybody interested in hearing more about the university the questions can come up later uh thank you krishna once again renji over to you please thank you tojo um again um, you know it's just give you a perspective on how my career um advanced so as a child right my, my dream job was to become a engine driver uh because you know when you go to the railway station in trivandrum you see these steam engines and it, you know mind blowing so i always wanted to be a engine driver and um, i think my parents probably convinced me that you know maybe there is an other career opportunities and um you know but growing up in india and speci- specifically uh, in my family most of the family were either doctors or engineers my grandfather was a doctor my dad was an engineer so there was all, always a pull between you know i should do one of these other choices there, there were so many choices but you know you could go into law things like that but everything was between engineering and medicine and uh, i think my dad won uh, in the sense that he convinced me that i should become a engineer and he was a mechanical engineer so again he convinced me that mechanical engineering is very foundational uh, because once you do mechanical you can go into other area so he kind of walked me through you know that probably is a good thing to do so i did my mechanical engineering at uh, trivandrum uh, engineering college and in 1985 um uh, is when i completed my mechanical engineering but while doing engineering um you know especially when you go to shangamugam beach and stand there and you look at and in the airport you see these big aircrafts right come land and take off and you know it always intrigued me always intrigued me like how man so heavy how does this thing really really fly right so even though you know i did mechanical you know when i applied to the us uh, like uh, ajayan was saying you know right to your gre apply to the us uh, i applied in 85 as soon as my engineering was over and i applied for aerospace engineering uh, mostly motivated by this you know unbelievable uh, you know thought of how can things fly right so i came here and my professor i came to virginia tech and my professor the first thing you know he met me and he says oh welcome so shall we start and uh, i was into research graduate research and he said okay why did you take aerospace i said i have no idea <laughs> i told him the same story i'm telling you and he said uh, so what do you know about aerospace engineering i said nothing uh, so but i have a good background in mechanical engineering so he turned around picked up a book from his bookshelf and it said how to fly and he said why don't you read this book and come back to me when you're done so i took it home it was a small book in couple of days i finished that went back to him and he said so now you know how to fly i said yeah i got a flavor of it is a fantastic do i'll give you another paper and he from his drawer he picked up a paper uh 
and he gave it to me. It was only eight pages. And I looked at the paper. It was written by two Russian mathematicians. And I could not understand the abstract. I could not understand the first page. It was all of equations, equations of the equations. And I had no clue. And he said, whenever you're done, you can do your research, go to the library. If you have questions, come to me. The next nine months of my stay at Virginia Tech, I was trying to decipher those eight pages. Okay, so it was you know, a very interesting thing where a mechanical engineer with no idea of aerospace engineering and getting into these really, really complex mathematics, right? And but my professor was a very kind man. He walked me through it. He, uh, you know, kind of really took me through, ha hold, handing, you know, holding my hand very carefully, taking me through those things. And, you know, I finished my master's there, came back to India, uh, said, you know, told my parents, look, I'm done. I want to find a job in India. And one of the things they asked me was, are you sure? You know, do you want to... Oh, yeah, come back anytime. Went back to him, completed my PhD in 89. And then, since then, I joined the small company called AMA, a five people company, a very small. Uh, we did about $500,000 in business. Um, and from there, uh, we grew this company uh, from $500,000 five people company to where it is today, about a $100 million company uh, with 450 employees spread across the US in about 10 locations. Uh, but uh, one of the things, you know, uh, again, I was fortunate was working in this company as a boutique aerospace consulting company was uh, allowing us to work on some really cool projects. So Binoy, if you could show, I have just three slides, uh, but Binoy, if you could show me uh, the first slide, um, which uh, basically talks about a, the International Space Station. The space station is a huge thing. You can see the picture uh, on the left of the screen. It's a huge thing, and it's a uh, multiple countries co you know collaborate and created the space station. So my first job, as you see there, my first job was come on, coming up with a control system. Okay, control system means how do you keep the space station uh, like literally rock solid flying in space? So it's flying about four hundred altitude orbit, right? And how do you keep it? That means because there are so many things trying to push it away from orbit, how do you keep it in orbit, right? So my first project was that. It was a really, really eye-opening project, but it, it allowed me to kind of apply some of the mathematics I did during my PhD to control the space station. And even today, it is, it is still there. It is controlled. It's, it's flying in a very interesting, um, uh, and a lot of science is being done there. My second slide actually was the next project I got involved, which is the fastest aircraft ever flown, uh, ever. Uh, so it's called the HyperX or the X-43A. And it has some very special engines called scramjets, not a single moving part. Like typically you look at an aircraft, like it has turbine engines and a lot of moving parts, right? This has no moving parts, but it's a very interesting thing. I, I encourage you to Google and find out what scramjets are. But we flew this aircraft, um, and and the certificate on the right just you know it was in a Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest aircraft ever. The first flight was a failure. We'll talk about it more uh, later on. And then the second and third flights were successful, and we flew it at tremendous speeds. When I say Mark. Mark one means the speed of sound. So Mark 6.8 means 6.8 times the speed of sound. And then the next slide, um, the last slide, uh, basically was, so some of the following projects I did were to land the rovers. There are so, so many rovers on Mars that NASA has landed. And I was lucky to be part of the projects where we landed the Mars Pathfinder, the Sojourner rover in 1997, the Spirit and Opportunity in 2004, and the Mars Science Laboratory in 2012. And another rover called the Perseverance is on the way. And on February 18th, it's supposed to land on Mars. So we are involved in all these very interesting entry, descent, and landing. Uh, so very complex, very complex to land something on Mars, uh, very complex, but we have come up with you know, good techniques to simulate it on computers and be able to land. So I think I took a little bit of extra time, Tojo, but I wanted to motivate the students that there are some real cool jobs in aerospace. 
Thank you very much, Ranji. And, and it is absolutely cool, meaning, you know, I, I remember reading stuff in newspapers and uh, seeing on TV. So it's absolutely cool to see and hear that you've been there first and working on some of these projects. Uh, wonderful to see and hear. Um, and I must confess, I've done the same, st standing in Shangamogam and watching the planes come down and go up. So <laughs> that's something that I've also done in my school days and college days. So uh, we probably we share that. But you didn't mention what was the trigger to, you said you could not guess what sort of got you to the aerospace path. I, I, I mean, um, like I said, mechanical engineering was foundational in the sense they teach right. you fluid dynamics, they teach you different areas, right? Uh, right. You know, uh, but aerospace is just an application, right? You, you can right. take mechanical and then go into many different areas, right? right? But aerospace is just one application of it. And like I said, this this thing about, you know, flying, right? That was the motivation. How do you keep things flying? How do you, how do heavy things fly in air, right? That, the concept of that was very intriguing to me. Right, right, right. Thank you very much. Uh, Vipin. I, I was listening to, to Renji and I was fascinated by how two people interested in planes, um, aerodynamics, and, and basically engines can end up in two distinctly different places, right? So as growing up as a kid, um, you know, most of you youngsters can relate to this, I think. Um, you know, when, when, when you are in Kerala and you go to a good school, right? By the age of 12, your mom and dad tend to have this conversation with you, right? And, and so that, that was the, the first time that I had to think, what do I really want to do? Um, Clearly, I wasn't a big fan of biology, uh, and, and, but I was, uh, I was passionate about aircrafts and how things flew. And, and I think it was in the sixth or seventh that we first had our whiff of you know, Bernoulli's principle and, and how things work, right? And, and so I, you know, it was intuitive for me to say, yep, that sounds like a good path to go down, so I'm going to stick with it, right? But I really didn't know what that meant. To me, engineering was about building things. And, and, and in my simplistic worldview at that time, you're either a civil engineer building buildings, you're, you're a mechanical engineer in building cars, uh, or you're building planes, right? Uh, the, 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 that was my, my worldview. And as I started thinking about it more, um, I got fascinated more about how planes were put together, how things came together, where things were sourced from, how things flew, right? And then somewhere, as I mentioned in my introduction, somewhere, um, you know, middle of my 11th grade, uh, the, the, there was a senior of ours that, that came to school. He was visiting from the US. And he talked to us about, he talked to the class about higher education opportunities and things like that that existed. Uh, and that was the first time that, that the seed was planted in my mind that, hey, not only do I need to think about, uh, you know, a bachelor's degree in engineering, there's probably something beyond that that I can explore. And there's a world that I can go into and, and, and explore and see what, what interests me the most. Because let's face it, by the time that you're 15 or 17, um, you know, you're passionate about things, but you're still trying to figure yourself out and where you want to go, right? So that journey took me to, uh, it's amazing how many mechanical engineers are on this panel, by the way, to mechanical engineering at, 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 uh, at Trivandrum, uh, and my passions continue. The things that excited me most were manufacturing processes uh, and um, you know, thermodynamics and, and, and so heat and mass transfer, right? Uh, and then once I graduated, I had a choice to make. Um, by the way, the, the amazing thing about Loyola and Loyola is every one of my batchmates that ended up in engineering college to Vandrum or the IITs or any other engineering school had a job in hand by the time they graduated. Right, through, a pro through process of campus interviews and things like that, um, which is amazing if you think about it. And then uh, you had a choice to make. Did you want to, to, to take the job at hand or did you want to pursue a passion? I said, mm, let's go pursue my passion. I'm, I'm still only 22 at that time. There's a lot of time left, left, left in life to go explore and find out before you commit to something. And so that took me to Penn State uh, in the US um, to, to do a master's in industrial engineering focused on manufacturing. Right. Um, so continued on there, uh, and and eventually what what happened in my career was, um, you know, 
manufacturing processes inherently require optimization. You need to make things better every day. So you're, you're walking into a production floor, you're walking into a factory, you're looking at things and, and you realize that there is potential for automation. There is potential for robotics. There is potential to make things more efficient. There is potential for you know, elevating the life and quality of people that work in certain environments. And, and so I got passionate about manufacturing processes, which took me to Dell. And Dell opened my eyes to this global world of supply chain. Um, you know, at the time, if you think about it, um, you know, to, to make it really hit home close to, close to um, you know, families and, and, and people in India, when you got a laptop from Dell, uh, this is about five, six years ago, I left Dell about five or six years ago. When you got a laptop at Dell, it was actually more cheaper and faster to make that laptop from China, put it on a ship, bring it into a port in Chennai, get it to Bangalore and distribute it to, to, to the rest of India through that supply chain process, even though Dell had a factory in Sri Perumadur in Chennai, right? So th there's a lot of engineering and optimization work involved in how do supply chains work? Where are things sourced from, right? So when you think about an electronic supply chain, most of your hard drives come from Thailand. Most of the mechanicals come from China. And so you, so, this is a process of putting all of these things together. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry to interrupt if you could also move a little bit faster. So we'll cover some of these things in the later questions as well. Yep. And so, and, and, and so the, 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 the process of, of putting together factories and bringing together things and making people assemble and, and work in harmony uh, is kind of my job. It, it translates into the e-commerce supply chain. Um, so ma mainly when you place an order online, how do you get a product from a warehouse to your homes is, is my responsibility to that. And, and how 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 awake or how how much sleep do you get nowadays? <laughs> Sixteen hour days are the norm because people want things faster and cheaper, Tojo. Yeah, yeah, and 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 with the big behemoths, I think it can't get any easier, right? So, so thank you, Vipin, for sharing. Uh, and 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 as said, probably we could go a little bit deeper uh, to that. So maybe we could jump into a next question. That's a good segue as well. Um, for the panelists, could you give us an insider's view? on the kind of jobs in your area of engineering. And also from your perspective, maybe if you keep the future also in mind, that would be great because a lot of our students coming up will probably take a few years by the time they get to the engineering and post that. Uh, Ajayan, and, and for Ajayan, I'm even more curious, you know, how do you get to nanoscience? Uh, so so that, that's also interesting. So, so if you could give an insider's view on the jobs that are there and how we get. Right. So, you know, there's a saying that uh, those who control materials control technology, uh, right? I mean, ever since we have been, uh, the, you know, the times of Stone Age to today's Silicon Age, materials have always had a huge impact on uh, whatever technologies. I mean, all, all the panelists who mentioned about aerospace and, you know, uh, the chip manufacturing, architecture, everything involves materials. Uh, but, but the fascinating thing about materials is uh, how do you conceive, um, you know, the best material for a job, right? Uh, and, and how do you really process it? <clears throat> so nanotechnology, which I've been associated with for a long time, kind of uh, gives you this amazing uh, frontier approach to building materials from atoms up. So, I mean, that, that's really what fascinated me. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a paradigm change because if you look at manufacturing, you essentially, most of the synthetic uh, structures are made top down. Whereas if you can actually build materials from bottom up, uh, atom by atom, and, and in many cases, you know, if you look at biological systems, this is the way uh, things happen, you know, bottom up. So uh, this paradigm change, uh, you know, it might take a while, but I think that will revolutionize how we build things, how we control materials and devices and every application that you've heard today, uh, you know, the, the fundamental aspect is how you control material systems. And the better materials you have, the better technology you have. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, so th that, that's one aspect of, uh, you know, uh, research. So if you are a material scientist, if you are in this area, you could find jobs in any technology that you uh, look at. So, so could I, could I, just, sorry to Sorry to interrupt. Right. So could I just say, how, do, how does one become a material scientist? Yeah, so, so that, that's what I was coming to. You know, okay. uh, today's um, um, you know, academic world has become very interdisciplinary. 
So, you know, I'm actually the chair of the Department of Material Science at Rice University. Uh, so when we are admitting students to material science, we really don't, you know, consider only students who have specific material science background at the bachelor's level. You know, we take chemists, we take physicists, we take even biologists as material scientists. So the field has kind of become very broad and very interdisciplinary. And I think this is true for many, many uh, disciplines today. You know, there are also other aspects of this, uh, like the computational part, you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, so many of the engineering disciplines have become interconnected and very close to each other. And uh, I think there is no issue at all if somebody wants to kind of transition to a slightly uh, different discipline, you know, within the uh, engineering or even science, even science and engineering has become close to each other. So, you know, I think someone who wants to explore the frontiers of science, fundamental physics, or fundamental chemistry, trying to understand how you can build things from uh, atomic level up, uh, I think this is a fascinating area. You know, I have to say that um, uh, uh, two, three decades I've been in this business, I've never really felt bored or anything like that. It, it's been really fascinating solving puzzles and, you know, getting to the next level. So if somebody has a question later on about, you know, material science and specific nanotechnology, you're most welcome to email me. Um, we can have a nice conversation. Thank you. And a quick check, was there any Guinness records? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, a Guinness book, book of World Records is very fascinating for young, young people, I suppose. You yeah. know, we, we created a very small brush, which is the smallest bristle using these nanofibers. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. And then uh, later on, we also created darkest material. And again, you know, nanomaterials, when you go to that scale, uh, it's not just the scaling down of properties. There's sometimes uh, a, a dramatic and almost uh, a revolutionary change in behavior. So if you have extremely uh, you know, tiny objects, it can kind of play around with light. So we created a, an array of nanostructures that absorbs the maximum amount of light. And again, that could lead to some fascinating applications as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, as I said, it's a paradigm change. How do you make materials, you know, top down or bottom up? Uh, and that's what we address. Great. Thank you very much, Ajayan. Deepu, over to you, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Jojo. So in my line of work, which is uh, product management, um, I just want to start off saying that it is not an engineering job yet, one needs to understand engineering in that domain really well to do what I do. You're not doing coding or building hardware on a day-to-day -day basis, but you need to have done that before. So it's a, it's a second career. But in addition, you need to be able to look to the market and look forward a few years. So for example, what the kind of questions that I would struggle with and other product management companies would struggle with is in our phones, what would consumers in India and US and EU, what would they use their phones for five years from now? What kind of games would you be playing? Recently, I went and I was able to purchase this old Nintendo uh, game device that some of you may have grown up with. It's black and white. Turns out Nintendo came out with, uh, probably for memory's sake, a version of it I could buy recently. Right From this to what I have on my phone today, it's a far cry. So you're looking forward into many domains. If you look at everything that your phone does today, right? It does audio, video, uh, multi-gigabit uh, uh, data rates, gaming. Two-thirds of the people on the planet play on their mobile phones. So the entire industries are shifting. Uh, uh, what you have in a phone today is well more at times than some of the processing power that you have on your certain lower end laptops. So it's all changing. Uh, so the ability jobs that put these different domains together and the ability to merge both the business side of it, because companies need to be profitable un unless you're a nonprofit to be able to merge those uh, two things together. So in product management, um, it will be having the ability to bring in multiple disciplines, both the bridging the engineering business, breaking down the silos between those two, as well as within engineering, how do you bring in AI that enables a better camera? 
How do you bring in AI that gives you, that works completely under the cover. So when you see video, when you, you, may, you may sense, hey, the low light quality is better. Part of it is not just a video block itself. It's AI working under the covers. So your photographs under low light conditions are better. The video under low light are better. So it's people and jobs that enable the merger of these enabling technologies. And then that goes all the way down to the foundry, manufacturing, what kind of technologies like nanotechnology that you, the, that you bring into play. So product management is becoming more and more and more important because companies have recognized in the early days of a company mostly is driven by technologies. But then once you get to the market, you need to make sure it's profitable. There is actually a roadmap that you can consistently build to so that overall the company is successful and the products are successful. So it's jobs where you have the ability to look forward, look ahead, as well as jobs that can cover a breadth of disciplines. Those all come under product management. So I'll just uh, stop there, Tojo, and then... Sure, sure. You can so, so a quick practical question. Um, so if, if someone from a practical engineering stream, right? So are there any specific engineering streams in your context that would be ideal for someone to go from engineering to product management? Yeah, I would say no. Uh, the reason is, uh, I, I was once sitting on a, a, a flight, Lufthansa flight, and a gentleman, Lufthansa staff, came to me and sat next to me and saying, may I ask you a few questions as a survey? And he asked me what I do. I said, in product management. I said, what do you do? He said, he's in product management. I said, okay, what do you do in product management? He said, he's a product manager for the food that they serve on Lufthansa flights. Okay. So product management is a very broad field right. in which... I may be specializing in smartphone chips. That person happened to be a product manager for food. Right. So he's trying to determine what the customer wants, what are the features of the food, what is it that they like, what is it, and then to figure out how to make it profitably. Now, so therefore, let's say you're a mechanical engineer and you have mechanical engineering-based companies that are delivering mechanical engineering-based products. If you're a biomedical engineer, you would be a product manager for, let's say, CPAP devices, you could be one for respirators, ventilators, any of those things. So what you need is a broad engineering degree. In my case, I also happen to do an MBA. Some, some product managers don't. But it is broad enough that you can take any field in engineering and then continue on as a product management where you're taking the leap then from uh, the engineering side to the business side with a firm grasp of engineering as well. Great. Thank you for clarifying, Bibu. And, and for the chip side, is it electrical, electronics mainly? Or? Yes. For my particular area, yes. If you do uh, electrical engineering, electronics engineering, uh, VLSI engineering, any of those disciplines would enable you to work in product management in my particular field. Great. Thank you. Krishna? Yeah. So... Um... First thing is, I think uh, architecture as a you know undergraduate uh, program uh, gives you a sort of very broad uh, grounding in many different things. Uh, I guess it's partly because of the nature of the profession itself. It's a somewhat of a generalist, I guess. But uh, so the first thing is that uh, people who study architecture end up doing all sorts of other things. Also, they, it's not as if they all end up practicing as architects or anything like that. For instance, a lot of friends. Uh, do graphic design, say exhibition design, furniture design, product design. Some of them have gone on to make films and so on. But uh, one thing which is there is you you get some grounding in design, visualizing things, and also in sort of how to put things together and uh, the, the technology behind it. A little bit of a, a intro to that, let's say. Uh, within architecture, I guess, uh, in terms of how you practice, there are many different ways. Of course, a lot of people have their own practice. But to be very honest, it takes a lot of effort, many years of uh, being at it to build a practice. And which is why often when, you know, people ask me, uh, what's architecture like? Should I be studying architecture? The first thing I say is you have to be really determined to be an architect. Otherwise, don't get into it <laughs> because otherwise it's, it's not an a easy profession. I guess there is no easy profession, but it takes a lot of effort. Let me put it that way. Uh, but over time now, what's also happening is that you do have a lot more large um, companies and larger architecture firms in India also. So that gives a kind of slightly different avenue in terms of how you uh, really practice. Uh, as a profession itself, I would say one of the things uh, which I think today is very exciting is what um, 
it is quite central to addressing major sustainability challenges material use energy use in cities and so on but the real challenge in architecture is managing to do all of that while also addressing aesthetic questions cultural questions and providing a sort of enriching spatial experience for you know whatever it is that you're uh, designing for uh, on the spatial data science side i would say it's a relatively less explored area in the indian setting Uh, on the private sector side, although I haven't really worked on that aspect, but I know from uh, other colleagues and so on, there is a lot of emphasis on the the spatial aspect of the data science now, especially with the increase in location-based services, GPS, e-commerce, all of these kinds of things. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that uh, we are sort of today at the intersection of in uh, you know massive data boom in terms of satellites. You have near daily or even in terms of classified satellites, you have like almost real-time stuff happening. and computational capacity which over the past few years has just gone through the roof in terms of cloud computing and so on and also the uh, methods the machine learning methods and so on which have really matured over in the past say decade or so so you have these three things kind of coming together and the field is really uh, going through a lot of uh, transformation so to just to uh, give some sense of you know um, what uh, it is applied to of late for instance with the covid uh, 19 and so on there's been a lot of effort to try to model you know how the epidemic is maybe spreading in different cities and so on so all of this really involves collecting a lot of spatial data many different underlying data layers satellite imagery and trying to kind of match all of these together to infer what's happening through all of that so uh, in general i would say my focus in this is really trying to address development questions and urban issues through the application of spatial data science so i'm more on the kind of research and academics in a non-profit setting thank you right. and 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 uh, thank you krishna so how, how does one get that practically uh, in terms of the spatial data science part yeah oh, well i guess uh, see i work with as i mentioned uh, with people who have background in say economics computer science um, statistics and so on so a lot of computer science people uh, work on i mean they do work on a lot of data science questions but uh in india at least there is not much emphasis on addressing the spatial aspect of it the spatial aspects usually fit under what is referred to as geoinformatics but the field of geoinformatics has in my opinion in india at least been a somewhat stagnant it has not been you know uh dynamic enough to adopt newer methods and data sets and uh, techniques so uh usually a lot of computer science math stat people are the ones who are more equipped to deal with some of these questions now great thank you renji thank you tojo um so on the question of the kind of jobs right you can big picture in aerospace engineering you can break it up into like four categories one is large industry okay so when i talk about large industry uh, you know like i can say in us for example you know you have you know com- companies like lockheed boeing um you know established companies right um you know they're heavy into aerospace uh, so and they have a lot of openings right and then you also have like the similar counterparts in india right you have the the airnets the, the hindustan aeronautics limited you have um, um you know brahmos you know you have companies like that but also these upcoming companies right if you look in the us you know there are companies like spacex which was non existent a few years ago suddenly they have come and they have taken it to a whole new level right you know you probably a lot of you have heard about elon musk entrepreneur aerospace engineer um, you know maker of the tesla you know i know tesla is coming to india uh, so you know there are co- people who are revolutionizing things which you know com- big companies like lockheed and boeing for example cannot do right these these small companies are very agile and they're coming and they're you know turning things upside down uh, so so you have these and and they're you know becoming now big companies so you you can have a lot of jobs opportunities in these kind of companies or you can also have opportunities in small companies like you know like for example our company we are a very small company very boutique in the sense that we don't cut metal for example we don't we don't cut a single piece of metal but we tell people how to cut metal we tell people how to do it uh, we simulate we make sure that this is the best way of doing it but when it comes to you know cutting metal we say no that you take care of it 
right so you could you could have and, and there are you know small businesses so many small businesses in india in the us where we can you know you, you can get a good job in aerospace engineering you also have jobs in the government right for example you can work as a civil servant uh, in, in isro for example indian space research organization become sada by space center in india you can also have similar things at nasa right you can work as a civil servant and the, so there are a lot of government jobs in aerospace uh, you can also join the department of defense for example here or the indian air force you know so there are opportunities there in the us also um, drdo defense research development organization in india so aerospace is very general right in that sense you know there are a lot of opportunities um, and then uh, you you can also you know like with, so you have the large business the small business government and then you know like for example being a professor like academia right a lot of research is going on in different areas and so that's also an opportunity where you can go into teaching uh, like how professor ajay was saying uh, so these are the kind of typical jobs now i also have to tell you aerospace engineering when i went into that area it was quote and quote rocket science people used to say wow wow you want to become a rocket scientist you know while aerospace engineering is interesting there's a lot of shock and awe fire and sparks all those things are good because rockets are burning right uh, you know fuel and so there's a lot of fire a lot of fun but i i have to tell you that while that is there uh, there are so many other engineering areas like for example bioengineering where there are fantastic future prospects that is you know like like material science bioengineering has a tremendous amount of promise right for example when the human health is associated with that uh, like crispr you have probably heard about the gene editing techniques like crispr um, so aerospace engineering and some of the other engineering we are talking about are not the only areas there are some really upcoming areas like bioengineering which you know as a budding loyalite or a high school student you need to think about those things um and then very quickly what is the future look like in aerospace engineering right coming back to aerospace engineering you know if you could put one slide i have um basically i just give you three good examples uh, on the top left is like we are really preparing for human presence in mars people might ask why do you want to have human presence in mars human beings fundamentally we are explorers we want to go outside the, you know the reason columbus came to the us you know we are always explorers so something can happen to mother earth uh, so we need to be prepared and start living in other planets right so human presence in mars is a big thing and you can't go to mars and land humans and all the infrastructure by using simple parachutes like i showed you for the the rovers right we need heavy things to land on mars so there are techniques like inflatables instead of parachutes so that's what is shown on the left side it's called a balloot or a inflatable system taking people and lot of cargo into mars so we are experimenting with lot of those things that's the left top uh, the left bottom is supersonic low boom low boom means uh, every time there's a supersonic aircraft which is going it creates a sonic boom there's a big boom sound is coming and because of that you never have supersonic flights over land that's the reason the concorde flew between new york and london so that it is always flying over the ocean right so the lot of research is being done in supersonic flight over land with very low sonic boom they're changing the boom to a thud a thud means like a car door being shut how do you change the sonic boom to a sonic thud right and then you could have supersonic flights across the land that means you could probably fly from california to um uh, somewhere like new york in an hour or two hours instead of five hours that would be a big thing and then on the right side i show some electric aircrafts that's a future right completely getting rid of you know aviation fuel and everything is driven by batteries and electric so we are testing this is called the x57 maxwell aircraft that's the picture shown we are testing it right now completely 100% electric not an ounce of gas so back to you tojo just these are some of the future prospects thank you very much renji uh, so i was just taking a quick look at the q and a as well and i thought we'll cover a couple of questions uh, because it pertains to that one was around the future opportunities which you have covered already uh, another practical question and maybe you might uh, you might be the best person uh, in kerala right now to answer this how can we get opportunities in nasa 
Uh, so working at NASA, you know, directly for a foreign national is very difficult unless you are just, you know, totally out of the world, right? I mean, they, they do that. They give exceptional, some amazingly exceptional people can come and work directly for NASA, directly. When they say as a civil servant for NASA, but typically you need to be a U.S. citizen first to work directly for NASA. But for pe- like, if you want to work for a company that works for NASA, like ours, there you don't really have to be a U.S. citizen, but you need to have the right qualifications and the right, um, you know, like the visa status, et cetera, to come and work for NASA. But a background in an engineering uh, field need not be aerospace. You can be a material engineer, like how Ajayan was talking about. Uh, we have a lot of needs for material engineers because every time you enter into a uh, planet, right, things are burning up, right? How do you prevent an astronaut from burning up? You need fantastic material, right? To protect the, you know, the, the astronaut. So materials are exceedingly important. So it's similar, you know, communication. So the electronics that, uh, you know, Deepu is talking about, that's important, logistics. So all those areas are exceedingly important. Habitat, like what Krishna was talking about, those are important. So, you know, multitude of things, but those can be applied for a NASA job. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Ranji. Whippen? Uh, so there are a couple of things inside a supply chain. I'll first focus on you know, my core area, right, which is designing supply chains. I mean, where, where do you source raw, raw material from? Um, you know, do you make a choice to put products on a plane, on a ship, on a slow ship, on a fast ship? Do, do you choose to you know, move product between China and Europe on a ship or, or a rail, right? What nodes do you hit? And so you, you, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's an exciting field uh, because one, you, you are trying to maximize speed and minimize cost, right? So that we as consumers can get the value of what each company is producing, right? The, the second thing that, that uh, is fascinating is the constraints that you have on top of this are government regulations and import export rules and labor ro- rules and so on and so forth. And so this is, a, this is a world where you have to take all of this and, and sort of make decisions on what's the best way to get something that you buy, right? From a, a raw material source to the end customer. Um, the key things that help you get there, um, you know, th- there are certain sections in industrial engineering, specifically around operations research that, that, that tailor and help you get there. Uh, and then the, the like, you know, supply chain is also a good application field for other things. Some of the, the new and exciting things that are happening inside a supply chain, like at Walmart, for example, um, you know, we are piloting autonomous vehicles, meaning you know, driverless vehicles to move a product from a factory to a store over the road. I mean, this thing was unheard of like 10 years right. ago, right? I mean, imagine looking on the road and looking at a truck and there's no driver in it, right? right. Um, so... So supply chains, you know, so you have an electronics and, and electrical engineering and an automobile engineering kind of fusion that are happening uh, in, 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 in it's an application space. If you take half a step back inside a factory, so that's a lot of automation, right? So if you go into one of our uh, fulfillment centers, right? It, you, you'll see automated guided vehicles running around the factory, moving things, right? Moving things from point A to point B. And, and, and so again, it's an application field where you know, a good electronics, electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer can come in and design factories, things that go into it. There's also a business management aspect to supply chain. You can be a, a leader of people. Uh, you can have your engineering, your MBA or your MBA as standalone. And, and you can lead large organizations and corporations that put all of these toys together, right? To make things work in, in a supply chain. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense on, on how to get there. Sure. Thank you, Vipin. There's a question on QA as well. I wish to pursue automobile engineering given the scarcity of colleges that offer this course in India and the bleak career prospects in the Indian automobile scene. What are my options abroad? So you, since you touched on the truck and the and the <laughs> the driverless truck, you know, what do you have any views on that question? Um, you know, not an expert, but my point of view would be that um, uh, listen, I mean. India is, is a budding market, right? So, so with um, you know, all of these companies domiciling in India to produce automobiles, to manufacture automobiles. And, and so my 
you know, my guidance would be that mechanical engineering is a good field to go into, that, that you can pivot into the automobile industry in India, right? Uh, there, are spe there are specialized courses, obviously, in the U.S. that help with it, but they all come under the, the domicile of mechanical engineering in, 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 from every, everywhere that I've seen. Sure. Thank you, Vipin. Um, just probably in the interest of time as well, I'll, I'll jump into a couple of questions which discusses uh, courses and uh, education. So since uh, all of you have been in the U.S. and again, you are a professor. So should a student do his or her bachelor's degree in engineering in India or the U.S.? Uh, Ajayan, let's start with you because you are in the academic sector. So what's your perspective? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, it's always been a good question. Uh, I, I would, at least in my opinion, I would focus on undergraduate in India and then think about going abroad for higher studies. I mean, financially, as well as, um, you know, the fact that uh, there are so many wonderful undergraduate institutions in India, uh, you know, ma makes that uh, a particularly attractive approach. Uh, but I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, when somebody does an undergraduate degree in India and then tries to go abroad, uh, the, the traditional path was essentially to apply for a PhD uh, and, and even, uh, you know, a, a traditional master's degree. Uh, but nowadays there is also potential of doing things like a professional master's degree and many uh, universities all around the world, including the US, is offering this professional master's degree. And the attractive thing about that is that it's much easier to get into a professional master's degree. Uh, you know, of course, it involves some finances. You know, normally you don't get uh, financial support to do professional masters, but I think the the, the bar is much lower. If somebody, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, you know, uh, students from Loyola will not reach that bar, but you know, there, there are probably many folks who wants to uh, get some exposure to international studies. These are short non-thesis uh, professional master's courses. Uh, so I think, you know, there, there are many options. And, and the other things would be to, if you just want to explore uh, a brief stint abroad, you could think of doing an internship when, when you are, you know, third or fourth year of your undergraduate degree. Uh, and there are many, many connections between universities in India and, and, and the US now. So th there are those opportunities as well, which was much more difficult before. So, and again, to go back to this point about, you know, how do I get into this field or that field? Uh, I, I think it's important that if you do a STEM field as undergraduate, you have a much broader options today than it used to be. As I said before, you know, you can do chemistry and come to materials uh, engineering for masters or, or PhD. So, you know, things are bit, getting much more interconnected, much more interdisciplinary. So the, the discipline wise uh, track uh, is not even really relevant. Uh, I mean, there was a question I saw in the question and answer, you know, uh, Sundar Pichai, who did metallurgical engineering in IIT Kharagpur, is the CEO of Google, right? So that, that's what it is today. I mean, you, I think as long as you do a STEM degree, I think you have enormous option to kind of broaden as you go to the higher degrees. Sure. Sure. Um, a, a quick uh, and uh, thank you, Ajahn, for that. Very helpful. And, and uh, I think that's a common question that we get all the time uh, around bachelor's versus master's. Um, which, which uh, and uh, Renji, I don't know if you are able to answer this, which institutes are suggested for students who want to go to the field of astronomy? I, I don't know a very specific answer, Dojo. Right. Um, you know, I can only talk about. Um, one institution which I'm familiar with uh, sure. in the U.S., uh, which is Cornell, um, you know, uh, they have a fantastic astronomy, uh, you know, department I know of, uh, but that's not my area. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you were the closest uh, that I could imagine in the panel, but thank you, uh, Renji, that's helpful. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, robotics, uh, not sure, Whippen, if this is your space or Bipu's space. What opportunities do you think a person trained in the robotics program, maybe even Renji, uh, robotics program masters abroad would have in India? Uh, let, let, me, let me just mention one thing and Whippen, maybe you sure. can add. A, I am not the expert at it. B, sure. I will say I have worked with several robotics engineers, in fact, uh, there was even an entrepreneurial venture that I did in that field. Uh, I'll make one or two comments and then pass it on. Sure. 
First of all, it's a very exciting and broad field that robotics is. When I think initially, I thought about robotics. I'm always thinking, you know, things walking around, making animal-like looking uh, human walk. But it's well beyond that. It involves, for example, computer vision. And the moment you go into computer vision, now you're talking things that can be, for example, like coral bleaching of coral reefs. Instead of taking pictures and analyzing whether they're getting bleached or not, you want to do it at a global scale. Right. You then have ships that go around taking video feeds. But if you have terabytes of video data, how do you detect bleaching level changes? It's actually a computer vision problem. That gets tied into AI for observing. So um, now translating it back into India, I do think it is a booming field, whether it's US or India. So there are many, many companies focused on it. It's not that robotics has you know, much broader uh, implications. And that's where most of the big companies based in the West have engineering offices in India. So those would be the sources uh, to go to to work on robotics in India. But maybe Vipin or somebody else may have a much deeper perspective than me. Probably first Vipin and then Renji. It would be interesting to hear your views as well. Yeah. My, my perspective is, um, like, I mean, from, a, uh, from an application standpoint, um, like I said, the, the world is moving faster, right? And, and in order to get things over to people faster and at a consistent quality at a sustained pace, right? Um, you need to go into these human, into these robotics type innovations. And so the application space is getting larger. So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of examples in my space. So you've got Flipkart and, and Amazon that, that are probably most familiar to, to all of you, right? And, and in order to, to get millions of things out to customers that you order online, um, you know, their factories and, and, and fulfillment centers are evolving where it, you're, you know, there's an automated pick. You're, go, you're getting a robot to go, go pick your item in, where, where five years ago, it would have been a human pushing a cart to go in there, right? You, th you think of all the automobile companies that are coming to India and, and domiciling in India, right? They all need robotics to get their, um, get, get their um, you know, production and assembly lines going. So with the growth of the Indian economy, um, you know, it's very similar to what you know, we've seen in the US, right? You're getting more and more automation into factories and India will has the same trajectory and the trend. And, and so the opportunity is only going to expand in India. Great, thank you. Renji? So um, one of the areas in, uh, when, when you say robotics, um, I think Deepu touched on it. Uh, it need not be just robots walking around, right? Uh, so even a flight, right? In, it could be drones, um, you know, which are flying around. Um, and you could have a lot of applications of drones uh, in, and autonomy. Uh, so autonom autonomous drones doing some specific job, uh, it's going to just increase like crazy. Uh, in the U.S. already, um, you know, it is there, right? Um, you know, things are big. You can deliver things uh, using drones. The biggest challenge is interfacing with the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, and making sure you don't collide with other things or don't collide with regular commercial aircrafts and things like that. So that is going to be in the future, even in India. Um, I, I, you know, one interesting anecdote is that, um, you know, when my daughter uh, got admission in a college, that college actually sent the acceptance, um, what do you call letter, using drones. Okay, and they, of course, they didn't send it to all the thousand kids who got admission, but within the locality, like about 30 kids or 50 kids, they sent it via drones. So they, they so in the early morning, you, you know, they would say, you know, check your door and a drone came and delivered the acceptance. So this is going to be the future, right? Whether you are in India, whether you are here, there will be drones and autonomy. How do you do that in a very autonomous fashion? Because there's not going to be a user who's going to tell the drone where to go. It's all automated, right? So I can see that, um, that technology being used in India. Right. Thank you for sharing. That's the first time I'm hearing about uh, uh, university acceptance coming in a drone or coming via a drone. 
fascinating. Uh, it, 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 it would definitely have sounded like science fiction a couple of years back at least, uh, or even last year. Uh, what is, uh, so a quick, quick question for Krishna Dantran. What is the basic potential a person who is producing architecture need, or what does that person need? You, you spoke about the challenge, being prepared for the challenge, uh, yeah. but what else? Well, uh, I guess one, one is, of course, you have to be somewhat obsessed and determined about it. Uh, the other, uh, in terms of, are, are you asking in terms of general aptitude? Here? Yeah, that, that's sound, the question was not that clear. So I, I would assume that's good enough. Yeah, you oh, could okay. speak about the general aptitude. Yeah. Well, I, I would, uh, like I mentioned before, architecture, to my mind, is somewhat of a generalist profession. And uh, uh, what I've seen is that people who have a kind of broader outlook uh, seem to thrive in it and uh, do better because you have to kind of bring together many, many different aspects, the environmental, the human, the kind of cultural, the aesthetic, the technical, all of these kind of need to be brought together. And people who have a general bend of mind who across all of these things seem to do better. And one thing, of course, is uh, some aptitude or initial ability to visualize things, you know, not necessarily drawing, but to visualize things. Sure, great. Uh, along the lines that we discussed, probably Deepu, I'll ask you one quick question. What behaviors do uh, students need to be successful in an engineering career or mindset? Sure. Um, key element is uh, analytic ability, and I'm even upping one level beyond engineering and the mathematics. Clearly, you need all that, right? So I'm assuming those are skills that can be gained. Some people have more, some people have less. It's okay, you can train yourself. But the ability to analyze situations, engineering situations, as well as business situations, and a technical mindset definitely helps, and that's where the engineering training uh, really, really helps. However, having said that, what really pushes things beyond that is the ability to work with people, as I'm sure everybody on the panel uh, will say, for example, Renji, right, when you, when you are the CEO of a company or you're a professor guiding students, we heard about inspiration, the professors, so that those people are touching something beyond the equations. What caused Renji to go spend eight months on, the, I believe he used the word, he was very encouraging to me although he was open. So that professor was going beyond the engineering and the technology and the hardcore Russian mathematical equations to tap into Renji's heart. So understanding the emotions and the motivations of people, treating people with respect and things like that. So those are the broader skills that I think make any of us, not just the technical skills, much more effective because there is no individual player in any company, right? We're all working together. But tapping into those emotions, understanding it, being able to respect it, acknowledge it, that's what makes people give 200%. 100% is not enough, right? So those would be beyond the technical mindset, the ability to understand motivations, emotions, respecting people, to be able to guide and drive a team to do something that's way more than in any of us could do individually. Sure. That's helpful. Thank you very much, Bibu. Uh, so keeping an eye on the clock, maybe we'll touch a last question. Uh, what is your most important learning or recollection from Loyola School? Uh, maybe your favorite anecdote, an individual who influenced you during your school life. Uh, very interesting to hear would be Ajayan, let's start with you. Yes, it's been a long time, but uh, I certainly think that, uh, you know, uh, Loyola School gave me the structure that is needed to kind of uh, pursue future uh, career. You know, I came from a very small school in Kodungalur and yeah, I was a merit scholar, actually in the boarding school. Uh, so that, that really opened up my mind and uh, gave me the confidence as well as, um, uh, you know, the, the perspective to think broader than what I would have otherwise. Uh, there are lots of anecdotes. You know, I used to be a constant uh, uh, you know, player in the in the theater and dramas, and you know, I, I, almost every school day I, I was performing something. So there's a lot of memories. Um, and again, you know, I, I suppose the boarding school is not there anymore, but that that, that was uh, uh, something very special. And I think you know, we lived 
together and you know uh, savored a lot of wonderful things together and the memories are very vivid thank you very much ajayan deepu i'd say uh, two things number one um, dignity of labor the first time i was told that we need to clean those toilets those are not exciting tasks but when you have three people working with you to clean all the dirty toilets that we ourselves have dirty it really taught me that no task is beneath me and there is no classes that i can operate in saying i'm above somebody else so taught me how to respect any profession things that people do value them and honor people for being people not based on their profession number one number two i felt coming from a different school in trivandrum to loyola see change i was treated like an adult i was not talked down to uh, teachers were asking me my opinion not just to me but to everybody i was involved in so many things uh, i can name a few names but that doesn't cover everything mr bio sebastian father uh, cp worky father worky sanikuri father manipadam mr joy thomas who taught us to measure the speed of a train while we are going for some competition by the click clack sound and he knew the rail track length so making these things exciting but ever all just treating me more like an adult than as a child really really equipped me uh, for the rest of my life so those would be two things that really stand out to me thank you very much deepu krishna yeah so uh, you know when you are in school like as you take all of this for granted and as a, a somewhat like uh, uh, what deepu mentioned it's only later when i was doing my undergrad in delhi and talking to people from all sorts of other schools you realize like wow loyola was really different let's say and uh, like uh, deepu mentioned in a way i i think comparing now looking back to you know uh, what others have mentioned about their own schools and so on uh, what i realized is that loyola really recognized children as individuals who can take initiative and have independence and also encouraged to ask questions without you know fear in, in class and that i think was one of the most important things the other most important thing which actually other friends when i tell them about loyola find very funny is that you know there used to be a line in our school diary you know, on the left side where it talks about uniform there was a line which said footwear must be firmly fastened to your feet that that is like they find it so amusing that there was a line like that in a school uniform description which i Uh, now maybe things have changed but uh, looking back i feel that that had a lot of meaning you know that that really symbolized something about the school and that that i i thought was really amazing right thank you krishna that was interesting renji uh so two things one is um, you know i should be involved in a lot of sports especially team sports uh, like playing cricket you know soccer uh, hockey uh, so i think that helped a lot uh, you know you know it helped with a lot of the thinking of leadership and things like that uh, but you know anecdotally one very interesting thing happened uh, one i think it was ninth standard uh, i think i was a class leader for one one you know few months i guess uh, and uh, so as a class leader right we had the rule that if your teacher does not come to class in the first 10 minutes right you can go and ask for uh the soccer ball and everybody can go to the soccer field and play soccer right mm-hmm. so i that's exactly what i did i waited for 10 minutes and thankfully the teacher didn't come so told everybody let's go so we all went to the soccer field and started playing you know soccer and football hit that right so what happened is he actually came after like 2 minutes and found the class empty so he summoned the class leader and the class to come back to the class and then he told who is the class leader so i raised my hand and he said get out of the class okay i'm not going to name who it is get out of the class so i'm 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 so totally perplexed i told him hey 10 minutes you came later so i went i followed the rules no get out so i'm standing outside and father cp work he walks by and you know he's coming after like maybe in in 20 minutes or so and he says uh, what are you standing outside for i said i narrated the story to him he said that's not fair he walked into the class asked the teacher to come out and then you know arbitrated between us and he told get back in the class so this is just a simple example but it showed that you know look i'm just a student right he had no reason to side with me but 
the kind of the honesty and the integrity which with which he operated right and and also leadership right that kind of gives you an example a great example uh, that you know what it doesn't matter who you're dealing with you know whether it is a student a, you know a colleague whoever it is right just do the right thing and i think that was a good example which i never forget wonderful thank you renji weapon uh i you know i think when i reflect back on loyola it's the bonds that you form in school that 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 stick up the most to me right so all of you youngsters that are in loyola when you go to class next week and you look around you right the people that you see are going to be your best friends for the rest of your life your closest friend circle right the connection that they have back with the school the teachers uh and and so loyola kind of puts you in that environment where you are going to work together right you 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 get pushed out of your comfort zone you, you get asked to participate in youth festivals and sports you get pushed to to speak in assemblies right and and through a process of all of that what happens is you form a real tight bond as as loyola shapes your future and your career so cherish every moment that you're at school and and like krishna said once you get out of school and look back you you'll find that uh, loyola has made you into who you are when when you reflect on it thank you very much vipin thank you for all your really interesting uh, uh, memories from loyola times um so uh, to the audience i apologize we are running a few minutes a couple of more minutes if i could ask for your time please uh, we'll just jump into a couple of poll questions for you before we close um so could we have our poll question 3 on your feedback for our session today please how do you rate the content of today's session and again similar to earlier if you can select and click submit maybe in another 15 seconds okay right 77% very good 20% so 97% good or very good thank you can we have the last poll question please i think that's on the panel how do you rate the panelists so this is live feedback for us right Ten more seconds. This is the one we are, where we are all very curious to see. Excellent. Eighty-nine percent, very good. Eight percent, good. Uh, that's wonderful. So it 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 may it tells us also that uh, um, this is time worth spending for you, uh, students, parents, everyone else who's joined it. so let me take this opportunity to sincerely thank you once again to all our panelists for making time uh, at uh, for some of you odd times in the morning uh, and uh, uh, also to all the participants and attendees from loyola parents from other schools thank you very much for joining hopefully you've all gotten something out of this discussion it's very difficult to get everything out of one discussion for vast areas like this uh, this has been a great discussion personally for me and i've learned uh, quite a few things myself Uh, thank you also for sharing your feedback for us so that's always helpful if you still have questions uh, for our panel or for uh, the team please email it to explorelobat@gmail.com uh, i also take this opportunity to thank people who work behind the scenes uh, because uh, we have a team working always hard behind the scenes to make this all look very good so thanks to that team uh, and do note that we have a great session coming up next sunday so not saturday next sunday uh and that's going to be on data science machine learning it artificial intelligence and this is your opportunity to absolutely uh come in and ask some of the questions that you may may have thought would be covered today but they will come in uh next week so thank you very much again for staying with us five more minutes wishing you a good night or day wherever you are and uh, hope to cross paths at some point <laughs>